grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I love these hymns. This is always my problem at Christmas time. I lose my voice so quickly because I just want to sing them as loud as I possibly can. And you know that's loud. But you know, when we sing these hymns, and especially when we hear the scriptures read, almost everyone we've heard from in the Christmas story tonight seems to be afraid of something. And mostly they're the same fears that you've brought with you into our church this evening. Elizabeth is afraid she'll never have a baby. At her age, she should have been pregnant many times over, but she's not. She's barren. Actually, the scriptures say she's called barren. I always wonder if that's like people called her by that, like a nickname. Mary's afraid that she'll never be married. At her age, she should not be pregnant, but she is. And in a culture that takes a very dim view of unwed mothers, things look rather bleak for her. Zacharias, as you know, is a priest and he's struggling with his faith in God. Though he goes about his priestly duties, he's afraid that the Lord no longer hears his prayers. Joseph is a parishioner struggling with his faith in Mary. The one that he is betrothed to is pregnant. And it's a disgrace. And he's afraid this means a public shaming for her. Caesar Augustus, he's afraid too. As CEO of the world's biggest economy and a commander in chief of the world's biggest army, he's counting noses and he's raising taxes, hoping to hold on to an empire that has this habit of assassinating weak leaders. Shepherds are afraid of the angels, understandably. Later on, the Magi are afraid of King Herod, with King Herod afraid of losing his job, of being unemployed when the big bills come due. As the story was once told again in our hearing, and even in our singing, it sounds like fear. The opposite of fear is safe. When we're safe, it's because there's nothing left to fear. But how is anybody going to make us safe? How is anybody going to displace the fears that we brought in here with us tonight? From the infertility, to teen pregnancy, to unanswered prayers, to divorce, to job stress, to big bills, bad bosses, unemployment, lost faith, and whatever else you care to add to the Christmas story. Who can fix all of that? Well, that's Jesus' job. Because Jesus comes to make all things new. To make them good, to make them well, to make them safe. All things. It's a startling idea, of course, that a virgin was selected by God to bear his son as a way of showing concern and love for you and for me as a way to make us safe. But if we just watch it play out and, and then embrace it as righteousness and grace trump evil and violence, it's a shock to the heart. One that I trust will give you some hope, some encouragement, so as to never be the same again. To do his job, to make us safe, Jesus starts where we start, taking flesh and blood from his mother's womb. To make us safe, he lives out our lives as we live, sharing our joys and, of course, sharing our sadnesses. Jesus was born poor. And although he was later presented with this amazing gift of gold by the Magi, it was all that was needed as he spent time in Egypt as a refugee. The thought is, is that his father died when he was no more than a teenager. His family thought of him as crazy, and his closest friends, as you know, betrayed him. He did his job in such a way that none of us can ever say, Jesus doesn't understand what I've been through. But he does. And to make us safe, he even dies our death gobbling up every last one of our sins 
And then when our sins have poisoned him, he dies innocent, tortured and murdered, and finally to be buried in a borrowed tomb. To make us safe, though, Jesus rises with our resurrection. Jesus rouses the flesh that Mary gave him as a Christmas gift, coming forth glorious, ascending, as we see in the stained glass, ascending into heaven to the feast that has no end. And there he is with those whom you love, those who have gone before us in the faith. Jesus is there with them for us. So if that really is a Christmas story, that Jesus has done his job in flesh and blood, and then why don't we feel safe tonight? Why are we still troubled with so many of our fears? Why are we still so afraid of things in our lives and afraid even of our own death? Could it be that we have lost track of this child? I mean, here is God come to earth in flesh and blood and dropped right into our laps, asking us to see him and to hear him and to hold him and to own him, asking us to have him as the center of our existence, asking us to tend him, tend to him where he lies, which is where? It's in the water of the font, in the pages of Holy Scripture, and in the bread and wine of his Holy Supper. Asking that he could come first so that as he grows, he may tend to you, with you, in you, on you, displacing your fears so that you can live in peace and hope and safe from all that troubles you. You know, the world is a very, very tough place. Sin on the inside, evil on the outside. Sometimes we can explain that trouble that or we can explain the trouble that comes our way, infertility, pregnancy, marriage, divorce, big bills, small faith, death. Sometimes we can explain the trouble as a matter of, I don't know, bad genes or bad families, bad choices, bad luck. But sometimes we cannot explain our troubles. Sometimes we get blindsided by a Caesar who demands that we travel back home for the census, or blindsided by a Herod who orders the death of all the little baby boys born in Bethlehem, or even blindsided by a Judas who comes embracing and kissing as we suffer, we have absolutely no idea what just happened to us. Either way, whether we can explain our troubles or not, if we lose track of this child, then we'll get lost for sure in fear. Lost in the darkness so deep that we cannot find our way out. Fear only gets fixed, as it were, when it gets pushed aside, when it gets displaced, when it's forced to flee by a force that's bigger than itself. And so Jesus comes to us yet again this Christmas. Fear not, says the angel to Mary, and the angel gives her Jesus. With his words, Mary is forgiven, she is hallowed. He puts Christ in the center of her life, in the center of her very body, her womb. Using this young woman as the mother of God. No fear. Fear not, says the angel to the shepherds, and with that the angels give him Jesus, give them Jesus. He forgives them welcomes them, the oppressed, the outclass, the underclass, they're included too. The angels bestow the presence of Christ, putting Christ at the center of all things for those shepherds, using them to be the very first witnesses of his incarnation.
no fear. And fear not, says the angel, to each one of you. And with that, he gives you Jesus, who forgives you, draws you toward him once again, encouraging you for the days, of he uh, days ahead, bestowing on you the presence of Christ, putting Christ front and center of your life at the altar, at the pulpit, and at the font. So this Jesus, he enters your flesh, he enters your world, your troubles, your suffering, and your fears, standing by you in every circumstance, leaving you with nothing to fear and making you safe. Merry Christmas, everyone. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.